Good day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Another live with Kevin, if you will. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, if you're with us live, I hope that you will start by going into that little comment area in whatever social platform you're on and say hello and tell us where you're located. We'd love to know that. I love knowing who's here. Uh, and uh, so I appreciate you doing that. It, it's a community of us that are here together. And so doing that is fantastic. And then while you're here, I want you to imagine that you're joining my guest and I, who I'll introduce in a second, for a cup of coffee or a glass of water or whatever. And so if if you were doing that, if you had a question, you'd ask it. If you had a comment, you'd share it. If you had an idea, you'd bring it to the forefront. So if you have questions, comments, and ideas, just share them. Um, it'll make for a better conversation and eventually for a better pod podcast. And so you heard me say that, that this eventually will be a podcast, but not all the short ramblings I've just shared. That'll all be trimmed out for the podcast. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is do a countdown where we will actually begin the podcast itself. So feel free to interact. Please do that. I hope you will. And uh, we're going to do start the actual podcast episode in three, two, one. Little hinges swing big doors. I first heard this from one of my mentors, and it is profoundly true. One example, decisions. Little decisions can make a big difference. And one decision too many people make is saying whatever. Our guest today is waging a war on whatever, and I'm joining him in this battle. Uh, so get ready for a fun and important conversation while we talk about that word, whatever. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you're listening to this podcast, you could have been with us live. Well, you could be for future episodes anyway, on your facial, excuse me, favorite social channel. Uh, you can get all future live episodes and therefore interact with us and see them sooner. In this case, like over a month sooner uh, by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups, just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to do that. And today's episode is brought to you by our new book, The Long Distance Team, Designing a Team for Everyone's Success. You can learn more at longdistanceteambook.com. And now I'm going to bring in our guest. I'll introduce him. Let me get him on screen. There he is. And let me introduce to you Richard or Rich Moran. He is a Silicon Valley-based business leader, workplace pundit, best-selling author, venture capitalist, former CEO, and college president. He is best known for his series of humorous business books, beginning with the best-selling Never Com Confuse a Memo with Reality, and is credited with starting the genre of business bullet books. I have a couple of those on my shelves. His uh, body of work includes 10 books about using common sense in business. He's the host of the CBS syndicated radio program, In the Workplace. He's appeared on CNN, NPR, and most major media outlets, and he continues his work with organizations to help them make better decisions and is an influencer on LinkedIn, where he is a regular contributor. And specifically, today we're talking about his brand new book, which is titled, appropriately, Never Say Whatever, How Big Decisions Make a Big Difference. Uh, Richard, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Hi, Kevin. Great. But that's, a, that's quite an introduction. It sounds like someone who can't keep a job. Well, or or a modern day renaissance. Man. How about that? Yeah, that's I'll I'll take that. That Thanks. sounds better, right? That, that sounds that sounds all about a how lot better, it, Rich. That sounds um, a lot better. <laughs> so, well, since you sort of led there, let's let's go there. Like, what led you to doing this work? We don't want the life story, but like, sort of what? Let's just do this. What leads you to becoming an evangelist about this word, whatever? We'll get into the problems with it later, but like, yeah, what leads you to doing this kind of work? It's well, the book, to, the the word whatever to me is like a, a fingernail on a blackboard or I mean, pick something that is just so irritating that it, it makes you cringe and it can be in the form of whatever or whatever or I mean, the nuances of the word are are infinite, but they're all bad. Every time you say the word whatever to either to one of two things happen or maybe both. It could be that you're you're projecting the fact that you're a slacker or you don't give it you don't give a damn or 
it could be, it usually is that, or it could be that you're not making a decision. And every time you don't make a decision, you're probably not going to get what you want. I, I like to tell the story, uh, and this is not, don't worry, we're not going to talk about a lot of in-depth research about decision making, but I love the story at Cornell researchers figured out that just at lunch, when you go out to lunch, you make about 200 discrete decisions. And it's where to go, where to sit, uh, you know, whole wheat or, or sourdough, lettuce, tomatoes, mayonnaise. And every time you say the word whatever in those 200 decisions, you're likely to get the sandwich that you don't want. So it's it's simple as that. So so I I have uh, I've learned that everyone in every every uh, geography in every genetic case says the word whatever or rolls their eyes or shrugs their shrugs their shoulders. It's or all do all of those it's, together? They it's say all whatever. It's, while yeah. rolling their eyes and shrugging their shoulders. Right? Yeah, it's all the same thing. And it's, it, it's, I've learned that relative to leadership and, and your great podcast, um, good leaders don't say whatever. They don't consider that word. So some might, some in some cases, Rich, have, have asked this question, Kevin, why do you always wear a light blue button down Oxford cloth, pinpoint Oxford shirt when you're on video? Uh, it's, because I made a conscious choice once, I don't have to keep making it. Um, so there's always two in the closet here in the office, and I put one on when the time comes to to be on camera with you, and then I'll change out of it when I'm done. But that's a choice that yeah. I made, and I'm done making it. I I, I love that. It's a, it's a good example. I, people, you know, marketers know that we don't like to make choices. Uh, you know, there's a a great restaurant in San Francisco. It's uh, called uh, the House of Prime Rib. You don't go there with a lot of options. So don't go there and order the fish. No, like, no, don't you that. don't. You don't. So so it's just a good example of how um, we don't like to make decisions. We're all suffering from decision fatigue. And when you say whatever, you are likely to just um, not get what you want. Life is about small choices, not the, you know, well, it's both. But the But the truth is, there's not a lot of big choices in our lives. It's you know, uh, where you live, who you marry, uh, your career, your faith, your dog. But uh, people are hard pressed to name more than 10 big decisions in their lives. So then it's all those small decisions that make for a successful career and a happy life. And that's, and that's what I'm trying to point out to people. Make the decisions because you'll, you'll be happier. I love that. So make the decision so you'll be happier. I, a lot of times when people say whatever, it's like pushing it off or whatever you want. And, and and maybe I'm making that choice with my wife to let her make that decision. And and in fact, I'll be at some level, hopefully I will be happy with either one because I'm ch choosing to let her choose. Right. And, yeah. and yet your point is still so very valid. And, and the word to me is very much the same as for you, as it sort of makes me scrape. Uh, it's like that sound of that scraping on the blackboard. So, and you and I are old enough to remember when it was actually a blackboard. Yeah, I know. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you don't have that sound on a whiteboard, as it turns no, out. No, um, but no, you don't. So, so I, I want to talk about the word a little bit more. And and the first one is, as I was reading the book, I was thinking about the fact that man, there's other people who need to read this book. Like, I think that there's oftentimes the case, yeah, oh man, Rich, I agree with you. People shouldn't use that word. And yet maybe we're using it too. So the question is, um, how do we know <laughs> if we're doing it? Like, what's your, th what's your thoughts about the self-awareness component of this? Well, there's a lot of self-awareness involved. I, what I'm finding already is that the, the word is like an earwig. Everyone, including you, Kevin, every time and every, all of your listeners, every time you hear this word now, you're going to say, dang, I, should, I shouldn't have said that. It's going to be a, a constant reminder. And that's OK. I, I want it to be it. it I want it to be uh, like um, like like the jingle for cars for kids or something that it's, it's so irritating that you just stop. You know, it just makes you cringe and you stop. One eight seven seven. Just say it. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, just 
you're see you you get it so so i want it to be an earwig and one of the things i'm also learning is that people are telling me i love i love this book i'm going to get it for my brother-in-law or i'm going to get it for that annoying guy down the hall who's always saying whatever to his mother um who's on the phone um but we all sort of do it um i i learned it that the first time i i saw it and it was relating to your earlier story as a consultant, I learned that sometimes uh, my clients would say to me, whatever, and what he or she was really saying is, you make the decision for me and I'll blame you later, which they did. Consultants get blamed for everything. And I think when your wife says, what do you want for dinner? And you say, whatever, it's sort of the same thing. If, if she prepares what you don't like, then you can blame her later. But well, I I can, hopefully I, do, I don't do that, but I certainly can. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And the other thing is that in that let's just take that particular example, uh, because Lori and I have had this conversation when I do that. It's not it's I may be saying in my head and even my intention is to serve her to let whatever she wants. But she really wants me to make a choice. She really wants to know what it is that I want. Yeah. yeah. So you know, there's a dance in there even, but it still is your exact point. Like we're putting off a decision. We're not making a decision. We're uh, passing that decision off on someone else. And regardless of what our intention is with that, it's not serving any, anybody. Yeah. The only, the only good reason that people have come up with is for, to, for, to use the word is in the sentence, uh, I love you, honey, and I'll do whatever it takes to win your affection. And it, that that's a good that's, you know, line them up and I'll do it. But that's about it. After that, it can mean so many things that uh, that are deflecting a decision. And all the research is, you know, I love Daniel Pink's book about regret. And he talks very specifically about we regret the decisions that we did not make in our lives. That's where the regrets are, not the decisions that we did make but we regret the decisions that we never made. And, and I think that's true, even in the, in the small day to day. You know, one of the things, I mean, it's a, it's a bone of contention in organizations. People hate performance reviews. And, you know, so, okay, I have my performance review coming up. I don't remember half of what I did last year, but okay, whatever. I'll write down a few things. No, that's not the way it works. What? And oh, by the way, if that's what you do, you're not helping it to be a better process. No, you're not. And one of the interviews I, I, I did for the book was with an expert on, on compensation. And she just, she was very clear. Whatever is not any part of your compensation discussion with your boss, whatever should never enter that. So when you think about it, sometimes you say, ah, oh, I don't, I don't feel like getting dressed for this Zoom call. I don't feel like preparing for this meeting. I don't feel like I don't feel like doing anything today. Whatever. No, that's that's not the way it works. So please stop. So let me ask this question. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like like what's what's the whatever? Here's what I wrote down on my on the little thing across the bottom. What is the whatever trend? Like, do you feel like we're using, people are using this word more than we used to? Is it just a steady thing and in the human vernacular and then the human in human behavior? Like what's your take on that? Yeah, I think the answer to your question is yes. I think it's, it's trending now. And I think that, you know, it started with Alicia Silverstone in the movie Clueless when, you know, she would put the, the W up on the screen, whatever, you know, it was sort of a valley girl thing. But but it's COVID didn't help us within in so many different ways with our attitudes and and whatever can mean a, a sense of helplessness, whatever, because I have no impact on this decision. I you know, it, it whatever I say doesn't matter. And I feel that people are are saying that, uh, are are believing that today more more than ever. I can't affect uh, what's going on in in politics. I can't affect what's going on in my uh, in my organization. But one thing I try to point out to everyone, and it's a leadership, definite leadership clause here, is that 
I, my message is not to the CEO of AT&T or Apple because everyone is a leader of something. And it could be your could be your organization, it could be your family, it could be your bowling team or your church group. But at the most basic, basic, basic level, you're the leader of your own life. You're in control of your own life. And that sense of helplessness and, and whatever should not be a part of, of the decisions that you make about your own life. So it, it's, I can boil it down as low as, as low as anybody wants. So, uh, and I agree, we are, you know, we have control of what we do say, think, feel, and choose. Like that's what is our, in our control. And of course, whatever is a word, it's also an attitude, as you said, but I think what makes it so challenging is that when we use the word or have the attitude we're we're acting as if we don't have control, right? When we do have control, if we will choose to take it, you want to add to that? Yeah, I, if, well, <clears throat> I think we have more control than we think. I, I like to tell the story, it's in the book, of a woman who didn't make partner at a big firm. And you know, she worked worked her ass off for a year. And then in the end, the, 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 the boss said, hey, you know, you're great. You're not going to make partner, but we want you to stay here because you're such a good contributor. And she could have said, whatever, I may as well stay here, pays well. But she didn't. She said, I am going to make the choice to do something different. And she went with a different firm, made partner right away. And so you, we have more control than we think sometimes. And I think whatever is just a surrender, whatever and surrender can is often the same word. I surrender, whatever. Uh, I'm helpless, whatever. I hate you, whatever. And uh, it's just all adds up to this sense of uh, helplessness, you know. I, I think you're right. And, and I, I love that you use that word surrender because what immediately went through my head was, well, no one's going to sit and I surrender, surrender, I surrender, but that's fundamentally what. We're yep, um, I think we might have lost a little bit. Of, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Can you hear? There me? you are. There we are. There, there, there we are. are. Okay. I could see you nodding, but I couldn't hear you. Now we're all we're all back. Okay. So, um, let's make a little bit more of a connection. I mean, this is certainly what we've been saying all along. Uh, but the subtitle of the book is how small decisions make a big difference. So let's tie this a little bit more to decision making. Um, I mean, everything we've said, it's connected there. But what more would you want to add to that about how, about the connection here to decision making? Well, well, it's when we're faced with decisions, even the small ones, you, sometimes you Sometimes the whatever decisions are most on the small are most applied to the small decisions. If you're deciding about a career change, you're not going to say whatever I'll, I'll become a lawyer or an accountant or or a, or a butcher. So you don't you you apply real decision making skills to those big decisions. You do pros and cons and spreadsheets and use flux capacitors. I don't know. There's all kinds of ways to make big decisions. Mm -hmm. But the small decisions are often the ones that you say whatever because you think they're not they don't matter, but they do. All those small decisions are what adds up. And it could be as some of the examples I've already used about uh, you know the attitude that you're going to approach for the day, performance reviews. Um, how many times I'll, I'll I'll put out a question there rhetorically to uh, to, to the audience, that how many times have you been invited to something and you sort of want to go, but you sort of don't want to go? They say, oh, whatever, I'll go. Um, and then you you go and you make friends, you make a relationship, you know, and but you made the decision rather than say whatever. And yeah. and that's what I'm, but that's what I'm trying to create. I, I use the example also. Uh, I was at a baseball game with my son, and we're standing around drinking a beer and having a good old time and wasn't our first beer actually. And um, his boss goes by and I heard him utter his boss's name. And in that split second, he could have said, whatever, I'll let her go by or, Hey, I'll invite her over, meet my dad, maybe, 
maybe something good will happen. And in that split session, he said he decided I'll invite her over and turns into we had a great time ch chatting and it was, you know, a small decision that had an that had an impact. And and I also sorry if I'm talking too much here, I'm, I, but I'm getting so excited about the about the, the subject. One of the things I talk about in the book, too, is that decisions seem to come in clusters. And the, the example I use is when you graduate from college, that's when you have to decide about where to live. What about your career? What about this person I've been dating for two years and I'm not sure, you know, do I continue that or do we start all over? What about my family? What about all my friends that I had in college? All those decisions are clustered all at once. And those decisions that you make right then fo follow you throughout life. And anytime you had a whatever with any of those decisions, that's when it, you'll look back and say, mm, I, sh I should have, could have, would have. Those, those are the regrets that you have, but they cluster. And right now, I think today uh, between banking and uh, the economy and the stock market and careers and layoffs, I think a lot of decisions are being clustered right now that you can't say whatever to. Let's hope that that's not what people do. Being intentional is a lot of what we're talking about here. Um, so th there is, you, you you started out, Rich, by saying we're not going to, I'm not going to share a bunch of decision theory or studies with you. And yet you share one early in the book. Um, and we don't talk about the study, but the finding of it. Talk a little bit about speed of decisions because mm -hmm. um, there. There's some really interesting stuff here for us to think about because people tend to be on the end of the spectrum, right? Well, I should really, I'm just going to make an immediate decision or I'm going to wait and try to collect more and more data, et cetera. And there's a lot that says that one of those is closer to the better answer more, more of the time. Yeah. The research shows that they call it the two minute rule that you, the, the decision that you probably would have made in the first two minutes is the one that you would still make two weeks later. So the two minute rule is, is one organizationally and personally is, is one that, that fits. Now, I don't think anyone is suggesting that you should spend two minutes on, uh, on, a, on a career choice, but, but on most decisions, the decision that you would have made in that first two minutes are, are what's, what matters. And it's also, uh, you mentioned this, Kevin, about um, being intentional. Uh, I've, I've learned and as I've talked to people, the, the easy way to make decisions and the best way to make decisions in two minutes or not is based on your intent and clarifying your, your intent. So the example I use, and, and this is not touchy feely stuff, but it's, it's that actions follow intent. And if you know your intent, then your actions can follow. And the example I use is that if you intend to lose weight, you act like you're on a diet. If you intend to stay married, you act like you are married. And if you, so those are just personal examples, but organizationally, if you intend to be customer focused, then your actions and your decisions are based on customers. If your intent is to be profitable over the next quarter, then your actions and your decisions are based on, on that set of rules. The problem is it's hard to clarify your intent. Yeah. Yes. And, and sometimes that means going deep into your soul and your heart of hearts and understanding what your intent really is. And it's, it's difficult, but, but the, the, the more self-aware you are and the more you can clarify your intent, the easier it will be to make decisions. So you you mentioned earlier that all of us are leaders. We're leading our own lives, which I agree with 100%. And yet many people who are listening here uh, are leaders, large L leaders, right? They are leading a team. They're a manager, leader, supervisor, boss, person. Um, what are your lessons for us when we're wearing that leader hat? What are the What are the lessons in all of this for us as leaders? The lesson that I that I hearken to the most is to uh, set up some simple rules. 
as a college president, it was, you know, I had rules because there were lots of decisions there. I say, okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to listen to people. We're going to look at the data. We're going to clarify our options and we're going to make a decision. You may not like the decision, but it's based on that process. And it's as simple as that, you know, you know, listen, look at the data, clarify options and make a decision. And each one of those is rigorous. Each one of those involves yeah. some, some work. Um, and the other, uh, thing I would say to leaders is as a consultant, I often heard, oh, I have so many options. I'm not sure what to do. And the simple truth is that there's probably not a hundred options. There's probably three. The first is as is, and nobody ever wants as is. And the third one is, you know, break everything, start all over, fire everyone, change the culture. Nobody wants that either. No one ever chooses that. So now we've got this amorphous set in the middle where we want to change and let's clarify what that is. That's the second option. So there's not a lot of options. Typically there's, there's three and let's pick one based on that process that I've already, that I've already mentioned. Uh, so that, that point right there, everybody uh, is one that, you didn't know you were going to get when you came here as we were going to talk about the word, whatever. And yet that idea right there is so very important because the psychology of, of options or choices is that if we have too many, we are immobilized, right? If we feel like we have none, we're immobilized and we don't like having only one because we feel like we're being forced. Right. But this idea to say that in most cases it starts with three and then, okay, we're going to take, now we're just going to deal with the one is uh, is enabling, empowering, and helps us create more speed as well. And leaders should recognize also that sometimes uh, among the options from which you have to choose, they're all bad, but you still have to pick one. And as and my father used to say, Rich, that's why we get paid the big bucks, um, <laughs> right? Someone's yeah. got to make that decision, right? Yeah. If you, if your if your intent is to be profitable and you're not you, you know your options are to cut costs cut people or stay unprofitable and you know what you know which one you have to choose yep that's right so um I mentioned at the start of the episode our new book the long distance team which is in many ways about culture it's really in many ways about intentional culture so it kind of comes back to where we are uh the the question I wanted to ask you was what's the leader's role related to whatever uh, in terms of are we creating cultures of whatever and what what might we do to make sure we're not doing that? Yeah, the all the interviews I did for the book suggested that the larger the organization is, the more bureaucratic the organization is, the more likely a whatever culture will be will be involved because people feel like they can't have an impact on, on, on what's going on. And I think there too, it can be a simple matter of really clarifying measures and clarifying intent. I love the story from Mike Huerta. He was the former head of the FAA. He had 150,000 people that worked for him. And uh, when I talked to him about the word whatever, he said, can you imagine if air traffic controllers used the word whatever? So he said, we had a simple measure at the FAA. We wanted the same number of planes to land as took off on any given day. If that number was the same, then we had a great day. And he clarified the, the systems so, so easily that even in a large government bureaucratic organization, there was no sense of whatever in it. So I think I think if you have a whatever organization, it means things are slow, things are cumbersome. People don't make decisions when they are allowed to, because there's penalties probably. And I think that's time to say, okay, we're gonna get out of this malaise and we're gonna start being a never say whatever organization. I hope, you know, it's sort of like Harry Truman, you know, he put the, the buck stops here uh, on his desk. I'd like, I'd like leaders to put never say whatever on their desk because it's sort of the same basic rule. Never say whatever. I'm writing that down. Uh, so 
Is there anything, we, we don't have a lot of time, Rich, but is there anything that I didn't ask that you wish I would have? I, I think, uh, uh, maybe not what you asked, but my message to everyone is, is be aware of, of what you're doing around that word, whatever, and making decisions. And I hope I put an earwig in you that, you know, now you're, you're, you're going to, you're going to hear it cringe, cringe every time you hear the word. Um, and as a leader, I learned this also from one of the interviews, when she hears the word, whatever from someone, what she says is, tell me what that means. Does it mean, tell me what, tell me what you're really telling me with that word. And it really puts people on, on it, on, you know, Hey, I guess I have to make a decision. Don't I? So, yeah. It, it brings them back to, she's, she's, She's promoting slash soliciting intention. Yeah. She's saying, tell me what that means when she hears whatever. And it really works. And um, uh, and even parents, I've learned from parents, I, they say the word illegal or the word um, uh, whatever is now illegal in our family. And banished. Banished. Banished, banished as, we, as it were. Um, so... A couple of other things, Rich, before we finish. Number, the, the first one, as we sort of shift gears into the final round of this, if you will, what do you do for fun, Rich, when you're not evangelizing the <laughs> abolition of whatever? What do you do for fun? Well, our uh, I have f uh, four children. They live nearby. I have a wife who likes me still, and, and even when uh, I say whatever, uh, our we live in Northern California where there's always a lot of things to do. We have a, uh, own a small winery. Um, I'm not retired. I'm still working on boards and proselytizing, whatever. Is that enough? Uh, that's probably so. enough. No, I mean, there's, <laughs> yeah. whatever you want to say, Rich. Yeah, no, I, it's, I'm, uh, I, I like to, uh, uh, people ask, uh, what do you do for hobbies? And I sometimes I rake leaves for for a hobby because I'm outside and it's and I can see the end product of my effort. You know, you and I are both in in many many times doing work that isn't that tangible. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's hard to know. So whether it's raking leaves or mowing the lawn or doing something that says, "Hey, like we did yeah, something." There's output. It's not all bad. There's um, output. Yeah. Speaking of output. Uh, you want us all to read, read, go read, never what, never say whatever. And um, I, I want to ask you what you're reading. Like, what's the what's something that's your output where your output is a finished book? What's something that you're reading or have read recently? You know, I, I, one thing I do is uh, for fun also is collect books. People don't like to have books around, and I I collect books, I use books, I I I read old books. You know, people there's a shelf. Books don't necessarily have a shelf life. I'm reading uh, right now. I'm reading uh, Up in the Old Hotel by Joseph Mitchell. It's an older book, but it's about uh, uh, a guy who uh, details the stories about an old hotel, and he does it in a style that I like, what I want my own style to be is honest, direct, funny, and prescriptive. And it's the same thing that, that he does. So Up in the Old Hotel is, is an old book that I'm reading right now. It, a lot of columns from The New Yorker combined, but it's, it, it's a fun book that's uh, easy to read. And the more you read, the better you'll be a better writer. If you read a lot, you'll be a better writer. 100 percent i agree with that 100 percent. rich thank you for that uh where can the question you've been most wanting me to ask is where can we learn more where do you want to point people i'll for people watching i'll hold the book up again never say whatever how big decisions make small decisions make a big difference where do you want to point people where can they get connected it's, with you get the book etc sure the, the book is on all the usual outlets amazon and barnes and noble and all the usuals uh i hope it's in your local bookstore um, and, uh, I have a website, richardmoran.com. If you want to contact me for, with questions or over the counter consulting, I am, uh, happy to be, uh, happy to be available. Uh, cause this is something that's, uh, the, if, uh, my life's work is to eliminate the word, whatever, and I make a little dent in it, I will have succeeded. 
And you can also find him on LinkedIn. He's active there, as I said earlier. And I'm sure you'd be happy if people reached out to you there. Right, Rich? I would, I would be. Yeah. All right. So now, everyone, I have a question that I ask you every week. And it's an intentional question. And it is the opposite of whatever. Uh, the question is, now what? What are you going to do with what you got in the last 30 minutes? What Insight did you get that you're now going to choose to act on, whether it's uh, paying more attention to that word in your language or thinking about how you will banish it in your organization, or whether it's just thinking about the implications of it uh, in your organization, or maybe even doing some analysis of what's going on in your culture around that word, whatever. Uh, and maybe it's just recognizing the importance of small decisions and making, um, putting more intention around all of those every day. Um, whatever it is for you, if you don't take some action based on what you got here, then, um, you know, we were entertaining, Rich, but people probably could have found something more purely entertaining. Um, anything final before we go that you want to share, Rich? I, you're a, uh, you're a great interviewer. I, I, I appreciate that. And, you read the book. So I appreciate that too. I did read the book and I hope all of you do as well. And as you know, we're here every week. So I hope that you don't just say, well, that was a good podcast, whatever, but you decide to come back uh, because we'll be here again next week. Hope you'll be back to join us for another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks for coming, everybody.